The 2002 adventure comedy Big Fat Liar was a childhood favorite of mine for its Hollywood-centric plot and main character Jason, who always paired a clever comeback with competently layered t-shirts. This obviously had an influence on my personality as an adult since I'm downright smarmy now. And as you can see, the drip does not stop with my Frankie Muniz-inspired fashion sense. I was going for early 2000s latchkey kid, but I think I'm giving more like self-important stage manager for a college production of hair. No eating in costume. Upon rewatching this memorable kids classic, I was excited to see that BFL remains relatively watchable even as an adult. With an albeit slightly thinner storyline than I remembered, along with some still timely commentary on Hollywood's racial stereotypes and a series of set pieces that I now realize almost perfectly line up with the Universal Studios Backlot Tour, where most of this movie takes place, which, come to think of it, had to be a self-promotional move. Because as we've learned from the Marvel Cinematic Universe, the best movies always stop to ask the audience, would you like to buy a theme park ticket with that? So get ready to roll with the most manipulative 14-year-old in Hollywood for a look at Big Fat Liar on Clip Breakdown. <laughs> Hello television viewers, my name is Nick. Thank you so much for joining me once again on my channel for another installment of Clip Breakdown. This is the playlist where we dive into our favorite movies, TV movies, and other such content here on the web. And we break it down like a Hollywood backlot set to look at each individual clip and decide if it's destined for the incinerator or if it can be recycled this pilot season. And boy oh boy, did this movie just hit on all of my nerve endings as an 11 year old child because I was obsessed with movies and like behind the scenes of Hollywood things. This was the height of Frankie Muniz's fame just two years after the premiere of Malcolm in the Middle, which I was on the Malcolm in the Middle train from episode one. And I actually hadn't even really thought about doing this movie in a while till I was on the Universal Studios tour that I mentioned in the intro, where we'll see a lot of shooting locations from this forthcoming adventure. But first, make sure you give this video a big thumbs up if you want to see even more 2002 Frankie Muniz era projects. Agent Cody Banks comes to mind. But most importantly, if you're new to my channel, I would love to have you click that subscribe button right over here. That way you never miss new videos from me. I upload two new ones every week, so turn on notifications if you always want to be the first to know when it's quiet on the set, because we're shooting a movie. <laughs> it's 1.28 a.m. in real time when I'm shooting this because that's the way the cookie crumbled into my face. So from the beginning of Big Fat Liar, it's established that Jason Shepard our main character is sort of a big fat liar himself. Jason, you wait. Yeah, Dad, it's been up for hours. Just getting dressed. Finish that paper for English class? Yeah, Dad, did it last night. Did you eat your oatmeal? Yeah, thanks, Mom. It was delicious. Here, go, Chip. Mm -mm. Jason's parents need to find the root of this child's compulsive lying quickly because he's already charismatic, articulate, and Caucasian enough to get away with almost anything in this country. At this point, we can only hope they're raising the kind of person who would steal your wallet and help you look for it, rather than the kind who kills his wife and leads the search party. American parents coddle their sons to such an unhealthy extent that at this point, we're just trying to reduce that toxic ego from Scott Peter to Michael Scott from The Office. They're still gonna be infuriating and unbelievable, but at least in a way that's not physically threatening anymore. And that's my motto on child rearing. Good thing no one asked. <laughs> on his way to school, Jason is skateboarding, but he gets hassled by a bully played by SNL's Taryn Killam. He plays the bully named Frank and he steals Jason's, not Frankie, real name Frankie's skateboard. Have you ever tried to sit and describe a movie and like perfectly say everyone's names? It and weirdly hard. <laughs> Good thing I've got my antioxidant coconut drink, <laughs> which I just realized is caffeinated and I've had four. Interestingly, this role is the film debut for our love of my life, Amanda Bynes. I was surprised. I had just assumed she had been in movies before this, but obviously I can't remember any. And she was brought in to replace Lindsay Lohan, who was originally cast in this role, but then was decided to take a hiatus from acting for a year. I don't want to hear excuses. I just want to hear your assignments read aloud. 
Aw, remember the days when communication companies would just buy whatever technology the military had developed to kill Osama bin Laden, and then wrapped it in some colorful plastic to sell to teenagers? I wanted one of these Cbico messengers so bad, which as I just read on Wikipedia, only sold about 500,000 units in the world. Turns out not many parents are willing to buy their kids overpriced gadgets that can only communicate within a few hundred feet of each other. Except for maybe the Furby, although, I quickly learned that those were not a cool thing to bring to school over the course of one terrible morning recess in 1998. I can still hear their mocking laughter from the basketball court. They weren't laughing that night when my Furby took its revenge on all who had wronged me. And Furby still protects me to this day. So you better think carefully before leaving that inaccurate comment about my shiny forehead or that accurate comment about me being in my 30s. Furby says Nick can stay baby forever. So upon sneaking into class, Jason sort of shows off his ability to think on his feet and make up a story when he's questioned by his teacher, played by Sandra O, oh, about where his paper is. He spins this yarn about how his dad choked on a Swedish meatball and they were in the hospital all night. And then he pulls in Amanda Bynes character, Kaylee, to pretend to be the receptionist. And Jason even goes so far as to pretend to be his dad on the phone. And it seems to uh, sell the story until later that day when the parents both catch him in his lie along with the teacher. His dad is like, you told us that you did this paper this morning. And the teacher's like, if he doesn't pass this in by 6 p.m. when I'm teaching a college course, then he has to repeat my class in summer school. So that means Jason only has three hours to write a story, which to me is like hilarious that I mean, a three page paper in three hours, I would be like the dog ran to the mall. <laughs> it's over. But I mean, I'm a creative genius. So that just flowed out of me effortlessly. Jason, he has to work a little harder to come up with his dog running to the mall story. <laughs> Making up stories seems to be your God-given talent. Big and liar. Hey, give Frankie Muniz a break. Those onset tutors don't have time to teach penmanship skills to child actors who are trying to shoot a TV show and a movie at the same time. Hilary Duff was still communicating with flashcards until her 30th birthday. I made that up. But for real, I've heard that some of these kids working in Hollywood are lucky if they can learn to sign their own SAG paperwork, pass a long division quiz, and read Catcher in the Rye before snagging that GED. Because it's really less about their long-term education and more about making it so they can legally get three hours more shooting in per day. Jason only has 15 minutes to make it to the community college to pass in his paper. So he gets on his sister's tricycle. The women in this family, by the way, are non-existent. Like the sister, Janie, gets one line and is barely in the presence of like certain frames. And the mom also has like a couple lines just to let you know she's there, but otherwise she's just like always in the background doing this or that. Anyway, Jason is riding to the school when he runs, bam, smack dab into a limo where the passenger is Paul Giamatti's character, Marty Wolf. It's right down the road. You're lucky I don't see her for whiplash. <sighs> Uh, get in the car. Watch the shoes. Watch the shoes. Marty Wolf. Famous Hollywood producer. Jason, do you know how lucky you are? You could have just unwittingly climbed into the limousine of Brian Singer, famous Hollywood producer. Then your ass would already be on a jet halfway out to the Planet Hollywood Resort they built in International Waters. We might as well airdrop you onto Isla Nublar with the Indominus Rex. In case you're not aware, it's actually a very not funny reality how many child performers in Hollywood have been targeted by predators. These are like high powered people as we know now. My eyes were really open to this when I watched the documentary An Open Secret, which is available for free on Vimeo, which I highly recommend watching to hear from some of the victims of this type of exploitation. I always thought it was so cool how kids in movies could speak confidently to adults 
who weren't their parents and just like climb into cars and go places with them. Although I knew in real life, you couldn't do that. Stranger Danger was very much taught to me in school. But Jason obviously likes to live on the edge. I mean, he doesn't even zip up his backpack. As an 11 year old in the audience, that basically made him my version of James Dean in Rebel Without a Cause. And I guess that would make me that other kid in Rebel Without a Cause, who was like a little gay for James Dean and therefore went crazy and died. Hollywood, we love you. And yes, that is the official critical analysis of that movie. <laughs> Deal with it. Put that in your Kreller and bite it. Put that custard filling in your Boston cream donut and smash it between your butt cheeks. <laughs> what? She's late, it's late. Why do we thought? Why do we do the who? I didn't wanna shoot this video so late, but I really wanna get this out by Friday. And sometimes you just gotta do what you just gotta do. You just gotta do. I tell myself we're having a slumber party. <laughs> we're having a slumber party, everyone. I'll make some cold cuts. <laughs> okay, as we see, Jason gets out of this car and leaves his paper because he literally has no self-awareness. And we see Marty being like, hey, you forgot your, eh, what's this? And he starts to read it. But we also follow Marty to his on-set job in Hollywood, where we start to learn that he's not the easiest guy to work with. How many times have I told you not to call me Urkel? My name is Jaleel White, okay? Oh, yeah. Urkel was a character I played when I was a child. I actually remember this being a very helpful explainer to me as a child, because I, for some reason, was under the impression that Steve Urkel was a real person who played himself on the TV show Family Matters. Sort of like Ernest or Pee Wee Herman, who are two other people that are fictional characters played by actors, as I now know. I wish those were the kind of confusing things about life that still caused me stress. Instead, I'm trying to decide which table from Wayfair will offer life-saving protection in the event of flash flood, forest fire, or nuclear blast. And it needs to work with that coupon code I got in the mail last week. Obviously, Jason's parents and his teacher don't believe his far-fetched story about a Hollywood bigwig stealing his paper. So, of course, he ends up in summer school, which seems like a real drag. There are so many parts of this movie that just, like, really work effectively, I feel like. For example, showing why the summer school is such a drag. It's got, like, these comedically shady characters in there. It looks boring. So, Jason and Kaylee are lamenting what lame summers are going to be having after school. My parents are going on a river rafting trip in the Grand Canyon. My folks are taking a long weekend at some health spot for their anniversary. It'll just be me and Jenny from Thursday till Sunday. First of all, great job to both of you for sufficiently explaining why nobody's parents or guardians gives a single f about them throughout this entire adventure. These kids even fly across the country without an idea later, because apparently the airline ticketing agent is just like, okay, so that's two one-way tickets out of state for the unaccompanied minors. Do you have someone meeting you at the arrival gate, like a grandparent or internet pen pal who claims to be your age? The early days of the internet were not super safe for any child, if they ever got to, I don't think they ever reached a safe point after that, but you know. It's like the difference between dying out in the wild West, or I don't know, dying in a maximum security prison. But what I really want to point out is how Frankie Muniz was not just an early thousands fashion muse for me, but also likely countless other pre-homosexual little kids. My friend Joe and I were talking about how much we loved dressing like this when we were kids. The bold statement of long sleeve under short sleeve t-shirt, the chic yet sporty functional zip-off cargo pants, hanging your house key on a lanyard as an excuse to wear a necklace. We owe our lives to the brave fashion stylists, to the up and coming Disney kids of Y2K, who were secretly teaching all of us little queers how to accessorize authentically, but without drawing too much attention to ourselves at school. You know what I'm talking about, bisexuals who dressed like Kelsey from High School Musical. This trailer comes on the movie screen that catches Jason's eye, and it's called Big Fat Liar, and it's borrowing a lot of the language that he used in his paper. This part definitely doesn't make sense. Like, why is there a trailer for the movie Big Fat Liar when the movie, as we'll see, hasn't started shooting yet? Like, did they just make this trailer with stock footage to see if people might like it? I, uh, uh, no. They could have thought of a million other ways to make it clear that this movie was going to be made out of his story, but I guess they wanted something visual, so that's why they want the trailer, but it's distracting to me. He could have just as easily found out from seeing Marty on 
TV like he does in this scene where he's trying to convince his dad. And watch his mom. His mom is in the background like, That guy stole my paper. You have to believe me. I can't. I just don't trust you right now, Jace. Ooh, you can tell from the look on his face he's gonna need therapy for that later on. That kid was just mentally abandoned in a dumpster outside of Arby's. Dad said, I just don't trust you right now. So have a great weekend on your own. Don't open the door for strangers and don't light yourself on fire. Way to go with the mixed messages, cold, distant TV father. I'm sure a lifetime of melodramatic disappointment like that will get you placed in a hospice center that's just far enough outside of town to prevent weekly visits from the family. This state statement of the dad being like, I don't trust you right now, is basically the big emotional crater that causes Jason to go after this proof. And it's what he uses to kind of like convince Kaylee to help him at certain points. I wish that there were more concrete stakes, like it, it robs the whole conflict of power for me since he's already in summer school. Like that's kind of not changed if he proves that he was telling the truth. Why couldn't it be like, oh, if he doesn't have the paper and he actually has to repeat eighth grade and won't get to move on to high school with all of his friends. So like his mission is to actually get the physical paper back that Marty stole. Or maybe it can show how problematic Jason's lying is and they, he has like all of these infractions lined up from not telling the truth and this is the last straw and he's gonna be, you know, kicked out and made to go to private school or something like that. Maybe instead of Sandra O's oh character, she's like a kooky guidance counselor who's telling him how it's gonna be. I don't know. I like like that there's this emotional weight of like trying to prove something to the dad, but I wish it was also with these like physical tangible stakes that I as a kid could be like, oh, he, cause I, even as a child, I was like, oh, so he gets put in summer school. That's kind of weird. Like I thought his whole point was to avoid summer school. It's like, well, you failed. So once his parents head out, Jason heads off to Kaylee's house and is like, we're going on an adventure just like you wanted. He's got all this babysitting money saved up and yard work money. So they're just getting on a plane ticket and going across the country. This was another reason I thought Frankie Muniz was so cool was that he had babysitting money and I wanted to take the local babysitters course, which was like a CPR course for kids. But for some reason I was not allowed to because the sisters in my house had let us all know that that was only for girls. And I remember watching this movie in my living room and when this part came up where he was like, three years of yard work and babysitting money. My sister knew that I probably heard that and took it as a sign that I could be a babysitter. And she looked at me and goes, boys can't be babysitters. Just unprovoked. And I was like, oh. Okay, F you. <laughs> but we were just kids, so obviously there's no hard feelings to my sister, who can go to fucking hell. As though I even want to babysit anymore. Those kids can take care of themselves. So when they go, it sets up this subplot where they basically bribe the bully to go to Kaylee's grandma Pearl's house, uh, kind of dressed like her, and she's so old and senile she doesn't realize it. You know, this much taller child. <laughs> Once in Los Angeles, Jason just walks up to some car driver and is like, I'm that guy. So he just commandeers a ride and I'm just like, this kid is just literally a thief, just stealing people's car service out from like, are you Leo DiCaprio and catch me if you can? I never saw that movie, but I know he lies in it. So after a brief, you know, driving through Hollywood montage, the kids get dropped off at Universal Studios where they get on that studio backlot tour where Jason's whole plan is easily executed. They just hop off at the right time and find their way over to Marty Wolf Production Office's Wolf Productions or whatever. And at first it seems like Marty's gonna play ball. He even has the hard copy of the paper that he stole from Jason. But then he's like, oops, I'm lighting it on fire with my cigar. This whole sequence, by the way, made it clear how the movie was able to be shot on a pretty low $15 million budget since it, a lot of it is just supposed to look like the the backstage area at Universal Studios. You know, they didn't have to change much of the studio lot to make it look like a studio lot. And having just been on this tour like two months ago, I'm like, yeah, this is all basically as it is every single day of the year. Grow up, Shepard. This is Hollywood, baby. It's a dog eat dog town. Worse, we got cats eating cats. We got fish munching fish. Bears f***ing twinks. Bottoms eating ass. 
Hawks. What? Was he not describing East Hollywood and then moving west? I was just helping. Marty has Jason unceremoniously removed, but not before Jason sees his little palm pilot and snatches that up like the thief he is. And then like they always do in these kids movies after a kid steals something, he's like, I didn't steal it, I just borrowed it. It's like, if you borrow something without asking, that's literally the definition of stealing. It doesn't matter if you plan to give it back or not, that person didn't plan to lose it, so. But they had just established that Marty was always losing his phone so apparently he never ever once even notices that his phone is missing. I sort of remembered the stolen phone as being a bigger plot point but I guess I'm mixing up movies with like Stuck in the Suburbs where they actually stole the Palm Pilot of a pop star played by Taron Killam. Who's in this? That's why I'm f***ed up. That's what's f up my brain. Movies. <laughs> you may also remember the, that like Amanda Bynes doing vocal impressions was a big feature of her character. They established her doing it at the beginning when she was like Harry Shepard's office. She pretends to be the receptionist when they distract the receptionist. She also pretends to be the parking attendant to get the receptionist to run out and check at the parking lot. And then she pretends to be another assistant later. Like that's four times that they have her like pretending to be someone one on the phone and I just think Amanda Bynes made this part much more memorable and special than it probably would have been in another actor's hands. However, I do wish that they could have like varied up their mischief a little bit outside of just like calling and pretending to be someone else. Like let's have them put on some disguises. Let's have them like sabotage some on set things and like, you know, whatever, cause disruption with a movie star. I just realized upon rewatching it, like the movie is so modestly budgeted that it almost is like a little stale and boring at times. This is Hollywood, Kaylee. It's a fish eat fish town. They play by their own rules out here. For example, they build unusually small entryways to their production offices. They said, when you're so tall that you have to duck to get through this doorway, you're officially too old to audition for lead roles on Nickelodeon. Girls, you can start looking for any casting breakdowns that have words like mother or grandmother. If you see anything for like a centuries old witch, that's your demo right now. So thanks for coming. I don't know why, it just makes me so uncomfortable how easy it is for Jay Jason to basically use emotional manipulation to get Kaylee to do whatever he wants. She did not want to come across the country. She did not want to help him lie earlier. And she doesn't want to be here now. But he's like, if you don't do this, my dad doesn't love me anymore. It's like, eh, let's calm down. I can't go home until my dad knows the truth. If you saw the way he looked at me, it was like, like I wasn't his kid anymore. Do you think your plan might include food and a place to sleep? We also need to scavenge a round brush, ionic hair dryer, and medium hold mousse to make sure Kaylee can maintain those two distinct tiers of flipped out layers. I'm telling you, the early thousands were the peak of teen movie fashions. These Y2K hair and makeup departments were turning 13 year olds out with retro TV mom hairstyles and then just no makeup other than concealer and cherry chapstick. It still somehow felt realistic then. I mean, kids today grow up applying cream contour. That's why every student at Euphoria High School has the cool eyeshadow of the most unfriendly global makeup artist at your local Mac store. When I worked at a counter, the Mac makeup artists loved to make sure you knew that they were called global artists. I was like, okay, I guess this location plus the one downtown from here is the whole planet to you, whatever. Unless you're getting flown out to Abu Dhabi to paint a red lip on some princess, I don't think that's really what they're gonna go yeah. I'm just kidding. You better work Mac makeup artist. I have a pro discount. Thank you for help matching me. I don't know why it looks yellow today, but it's not your fault. User error. <laughs> so this is where Kaylee and Moon is. Moon is. Moon is Frankie find to sleep. I'm like, okay, I guess this is a hotel. Looks like we found our temporary home. Look at all this stuff. With none of it being food, water, or a working toilet, we couldn't ask for a better place to live for the next three days. Like this warehouse has no insulation, but I guess if you two get cold at night, you can just huddle inside that Grinch suit that temporarily drove Jim Carrey insane. Just a note, they were not able to Febreze the smell of his fear piss out of there. So breathe through your nose. No, your mouth. Both are bad options. You know what I love, love, love to get us into the second act of a movie? Some bullshit with the fucking trying on clothes. We'll stay here until closing time and then we go shopping. I, I wish this night would never end. 
great plan, kids. This Party City montage is the ideal way to distract from your growing hunger and dehydration. Security is gonna come in here on Tuesday after the long weekend and find their withered, dried up corpses clutching onto the plastic bread rolls used in Nutty Professor 2, the clumps. So the idea here is that they're picking up materials that they're gonna use in their revenge plan that, that against Marty Wolf, but none of what we see them playing with here is ever seen again in the movie. I wish that we could see them like discovering the stuff that they're gonna use or somehow getting inspired to do certain stuff. Like the montage in Home Alone is like literally him setting up all of those booby traps that we see pay off later. The only time I think a montage is worth putting in is when it actually moves the plot forward. This one here tastes like it's moving the plot forward because he says we're going shopping, but like in actuality, they don't ever dress up in a costume or pretend to be someone else, so it all feels for nothing. And it's the only time in the movie where characters break the fourth wall and look directly into the lens, which like most things in movies, I tend to hate. It's hard not to be taken out of this whole story when Frankie Muniz has me caught in his deadlights there, like he's the moon face emoji. Keep your eyes focused in the scene, kids. This isn't an Old Navy commercial, despite Amanda Bynes' drawstring capri khakis. There were parts in this movie that I guess I just didn't question as a child, even though now I'm like, that feels a little crammed in. What's with the Cokes? Machine, it's rigged. They're free, <laughs> they're free. <laughs> I don't know why that's so surprising to you, Frankie Muniz. This movie has been nursing at the teat of Coca-Cola product placement since your first glass of Minute Maid orange juice in scene one. Although watching this back now, I also wonder if they were trying to make some kid friendly reference to the cliche of Hollywood being full of coke heads. That's not exactly true in my experience living there, but I don't think Coca-Cola makes a beverage called GHB and poppers. Fruitopia maybe had that feel a little bit, but it got discontinued. By the way, if you drank Fruitopia in the 90s, you're some kind of gay now. So Jason gets on the phone with their driver from the day before, Frank, and when Frank picks him up, he's not happy because he almost lost his job by, you know, not picking up the right person and driving someone around for free the other day. But once the kids start explaining why they're there to get revenge on Marty Wolf, he starts to be like, oh, if that's what this is about, I conveniently care about it. He takes my headshot, writes loser across my forehead, and then faxes it to every casting director in town. You guys want to mess with Wolf? I got your back. I'm worried that it's going to be a lethal culture shock for Jason if he ever runs into a supporting character that isn't willing to risk their job to support his Slime Time Live nonsense. Marty Wolf's conveniently placed enemies throughout Hollywood. I guess they work for a kid's movie. Although optically, I can't shake the feeling that this story is essentially about the power struggle between two hopeless liars with extreme male privilege. Again, I don't like Frank's reason for helping out the kids, which is like, oh, we're gonna mess with Wolf because he ruined my career in the past. I wish they could give him a more strong, solid reason to help the kids. Like if J Jason is like, oh, if you help us, I'll get to his computer and move your name out of the do not hire folder that they all share at Marty Wolf Pictures. Or maybe Jason like over promises, like by the end of this, I'll have Marty eating out of my hand. He'll have to let you audition for this movie. That way it's it's sort of like Jason is still letting his lies or his propensity for lying get the best of him because then in the third act, maybe he's like unable to carry out that promise or pull through on it. So it like can lead to a little bit more of a repercussion. In this movie, it's referred to as a negative thing to not tell the truth, but Jason still manages to lie and use that to get what he wants throughout the entire movie. And that's never really called out as a problem. Obviously the movie thinks it's clever because that's Jason Shepard and Marty Wolf. So it's like the boy who cried wolf. But the whole point of the boy who cried wolf is like, once you're telling the truth, nobody believes you. So it's like, he does he shouldn't have any credibility with anybody by the end of this, but it's really just his dad that he's trying to prove wrong. Not like the whole town. So the kids use Marty's stolen Palm Pilot to observe his entire schedule for the day. And they have the production meeting for the beginning of Big Fat Liars shoot. And they have to give us a handful of new reasons to know that Marty is the bad guy. 12 different camera angles. Smoke ascending from the streets of the city. Whoa, whoa, whoa. 
Confucius say easy does it, Skippy. Nice try, fictional overt Hollywood racist. But you're once again just a diversion from the non-fictional institutionalized Hollywood racists who created an industry in the first place where Frankie Muniz is the most Latino looking child star allowed to lead a theatrical release. This actor, John Cho, actually originally turned down this role because he was asked to use a Chinese accent and he didn't want to make it seem to kids like it was okay to make fun of somebody for their accent. Which to me proves that even though the movie gets back at Marty for saying all of these things and shows them that to be unkind, it still kind of normalizes kids using that type of language even when they want to be mean. I think the movie still could have found fun Hollywood double crossing type ways that Marty is making enemies with these people rather than him just verbally attacking them for the way that they look or, you know, with their ethnicity. Jocelyn Davis, Senior VP of Publicity. Yeah? Sure you're not seeing a VP of Twinkies? <laughs> Jocelyn said, oh, you want to make fun of me when they're about to build a full-length NASCAR track right where your hairline used to be? But VP of Twinkies, funny, I guess. Once again, I understand that Marty is the bad guy and these people get revenge on him for saying these things about him, them, but that's really not much of a consolation from the perspective of a child who, let's say, saw this movie in theaters, who maybe already felt self-conscious about their size or their ethnicity, so then when a movie makes jokes like these and the mostly white audience around that child erupts in laughter, they probably carry the pain of that sort of memory of feeling excluded uh, with them even after the bad guy gets its payback, you know? He gets fired in the end, but really just for entirely unrelated reasons. It's just one example of why representation matters so much and it's not just with Hollywood and casting and TV, although that is a really great place to start, but we need representation even in our courts. After Justice Stephen Breyer retires from the Supreme Court, Joe Biden has said that he wants to nominate a black woman to take that seat. If confirmed, that would be the first time that we have a black woman as a Supreme Court justice. Even in mid-2020, nearly half of all states in the U.S. didn't have a single justice of color. We need equal representation in in our courts because these are the people who are making decisions that affect all of our lives equally. If we want to correct the balance of power in the government between corporate interests being represented and the interests of regular people, we need more accurate representation in the court. And right now that means we need more representation for people of color. Marty Wolf is mean to more people like the special effects guy, the stunt guy played by Lee Majors, who was the million dollar man. The kid Kids are having fun in this adventure. What are they talking about here? Something meaningful. Oh, I think that the movie is good at giving us these little moments that strengthen the relationship between Kaylee and Jason. He's like, thank you so much for coming on this adventure with me. Where you're like, okay, these kids have chemistry. I believe that she would do these things for him at certain points. And so the next day, they enact their plan of revenge on Marty Walt. It's showtime, Mr. Funny Bones. <laughs> you cute little monkey, you. <laughs> when I see an adult who sleeps with a stuffed animal, I just assume that's a person who would be in the furry fandom if they weren't so repressed. Not that I'm a psychologist, but something tells me if you've got a security toy in your bed anytime past puberty, you've probably fantasized about pulling a honey I blew up the kids on that plush piglet you won at the arcade and seeing where the night takes you. Hold on, I'm just gonna let this month's sponsors know that I've said something potentially disgusting. Actually, let me go ahead and not do that. I love revenge sequences in kids' movies. That's like my favorite part of Harriet the Spy, for example. Even though none of these things would have any logical way of working in real life. Like they put orange food coloring in his shampoo and conditioner and it's like as though he bleached and dyed his hair. <laughs> Did anyone else think kids in TV and movies always looked so cool when they would like handle things with their long sleeves covering their palms? They would be like, 
Hold on, is this the magical rune? Is this the magical ruby, the legend? And I would be like, whoa, that looks cool to me. It obviously still holds a certain level of glamor for us millennials. Ariana Grande is iconic for serving us those cozy Folgers coffee commercial sleeves, even when she's in the middle of the literal desert. But of course, the kid's plan works perfectly and Marty is dyed like intensely blue from swimming in that pool with the orange hair. Amanda Bynes pulled a few more crank calls to divert him to the birthday party of that stunt coordinator who he called old the other day. He was like, you can't go to your granddaughter's birthday party. So he said, looking like a clown and the kids attack him. Oh, and I guess they like even rewired his car so that his car is not driving well. And Jason is like, this can all end anytime you call my dad and tell him that I really wrote a three page paper once. It's like, that doesn't even matter anymore. You just gotta get through summer, like you should be at summer school now. That should be your main focus. Just cause you wrote that one paper, you still basically failed the class. Jason plans to get his final act of revenge at this after party for the f***ing guy, Marty Wolf's goddamn latest movie, which everyone is just talking about how bad it is and he's continuing to make an ass of himself. The very lovely Shaniqua. It's Chandra. Oh, great to see you. It's over, Wolf. Look, just hear me out. Would you excuse us, please, Shanani? I feel like Paul Giamatti is making the choice to play up his character's casual racism, but I'm worried that some of the kids watching this missed the nuance of that and are just learning to be casually racist themselves. Marty convinces this guy, the new president of the network, to hear how his presentation and let him convince him why he should have the budget to shoot this movie in a couple days. I'm just like, okay, this movie's playing real fast and loose with the production timeline of movies. They had a trailer come out like months and months before the movie even started shooting and the movie's shooting Monday and they don't have their money yet, but okay. So Jason appears and he's like, so I'm gonna help you. He, he take this, you know, I'll be on the other end of this walkie talkie telling you how to talk your way out of this and make it seem like intentional that you're blue right now. When he's depressed, he turns blue. When he's mad, boom! His curly locks turn the color of a flaming brush fire. Makes in love. The softest shade of pink finds its way across his visit. What color is his d Tell us his d color when he's horny, Marty Wolf. The test audiences are dying to know. Marty Wolf completely takes, again, Jason's idea and runs with it and thus wins over the audience. And then right when Jason's like, great, so you'll call my dad, Marty's like, no, I'll call security. And has uh, Jason removed and they're making him pack up his stuff from the warehouse and they've got his dad on the phone and they're coming to get him the next morning. So it's like, oh, end of the road. This is the third act conflict. Another point where I'm just like, oh, this could have been a really good moment for the movie and it just isn't upon rewatching it. What are we supposed to do? My parents are gonna be here in the morning. We tried everything. Everything. It would take an army to get Wolf to admit the truth. I think I know where we could find our troops. That's right, I've enlisted both you kids in the army reserves. The US government is your parents now. Jason, you should love it. They're a bunch of liars and con artists just like you. So as you see, this put upon assistant Monty, who has actually been saddled with like all of the hard parts of making Big Fat Liar, such as writing the script for Marty, she decides she's finally had enough and she rallies all of these other crew members who don't like Marty either. By the way, another we like pet peeve of mine with screenwriting is names that are way too similar. Why do we have Frank, Harry, Kaylee, Monty, Marty, wh they all sound exactly the same, you know, like make them distinct. So the next morning they basically plan to sabotage Marty's whole entire first day of shooting. Like they have Harry, no. Frank? They have Frank pick up uh, Marty, Monty. See what these f***ing names? Do you see what my issue is? <laughs> I'm not an idiot, but names make me idiot. Frank picks up Monty and they use a smoke machine to pretend that the car breaks down and Harry or f Frank pretends to be all panicked and he's like, please, Mr. Wolf. And that's when Jaleel White comes and picks him up and drives him to set. Who's a bad actor now, Mr. Wolf? 
Those are real tears! Uh, that statement has been determined to be untruthful by me rewinding the movie and rewatching it a little bit. There were no tears on this actor's face. And I would know because every time I see a grown man cry, I start lactating involuntarily. And my body can always tell when the guy is sobbing performatively just to get the udders flowing. It's not gonna work that easy, buddy, okay? I need to see real pain in your eyes if you wanna visit this dairy farm, if you wanna take a trip to this Ben and Jerry's factory. So Jaleel White now is pretending to be out of his mind and drives Marty Wolf to the middle of the desert. Okay, now this movie is the big fat liar. We definitely don't have perfectly groomed captive iguanas crawling around the deserts of Southern California. Because if we did, I would have already brought one home and incorporated it into my Miss Frizzle cosplay. But instead, I just have to make do with whatever I can dig out of the dead reptile box behind the pet store. Those are the kind of things you don't think about when you move out of the big city. After being abandoned in the desert, the stunt coordinator, Lee Majors, comes and picks up Marty to pretend to be like, you know, here's me trying to get you to set. And then they pretend to have some sort of emergency helicopter crash, so they drop him in on a parachute. And then he goes on a chase scene through all of the backlot studio with Frankie Muniz running with like the stuffed animal that Marty loves so much as his like hostage. Activate water. Okay, I don't know who that stunt performer was, but this whole flash flood set does look very familiar from my recent trip. Whoa. Whoa. <laughs> there it is. Our flash flood effect, the oldest effect on the tour, been around since 1968. Here it is on camera in a movie called Big Fat Liar. That's when they showed a clip from Big Fat Liar. And I knew I had to make a video reviewing this movie so I could show you this footage and you would finally think I'm cool. Did it work? Do you think I'm cool? And if so, you have to prove it to me by buying a t-shirt. Just kidding. Jason and Marty finally have their showdown on the rooftop of the cityscape scenery. And basically, Marty is like, I will never ever admit that I stole Jason Shepard's story and I turned it into the movie Big Fat Liar. Nah, 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 nah. And that's when Jason is like, guess what? You just did tell the world. <laughs> That's right, the real heroes of this story are the due-paying members of the local 600 chapter of the International Cinematographers Guild. Yeah, unionizing! Is it obvious that I'm trying to suck up so I can find a reputable camera operator to shoot my OnlyFans content? I'm tired of working with these amateurs who keep gouging their eyes out upon seeing what I'm into. So the director comes in and is like, oh, it looks like Confucius says, you've been busted. And the PR lady is like, the press saw all of of what you just admitted and she triumphantly bites a Twinkie which is a screen direction I'm hoping to get one day self-righteous hostess bite and then the president of the studio is down there being like you're fired wolf it's over so la di da we did what we wanted to do oh yeah I don't think that the most exciting stunt in this whole movie is when Jason jumps off of the roof and lands in one of those big padded like inflatable things I've always wanted to land in one of those granted but I mean the helicopter stunt was more exciting the water so it was more exciting so that felt like maybe these set pieces were a little out of sequence but whatever I'm honestly just glad the movie's over at this point <laughs> you did all this just to prove you weren't lying I wanted to earn your trust back then You've earned it, buddy. All it took to earn my trust back was demonstrating your capacity for larger, more elaborate lies and reckless behaviors like convincing your friend to go on a dangerous cross-country trip without supervision. Here, son, these are the keys to my car and my heart medication, and you can fly the plane on the way home. I trust you with my life now. What kind of backwards logic is this? This kid, he's been lying, he's still lying, he's gonna lie forever because he's never had anything bad happen to him for lying. In fact, the one time he told the truth, it didn't work work out for him, so he had better luck lying. I'm just saying. They're not really nailing home the whole thing of like, oh, the truth is not always overrated. That's why I think that third act would have been more powerful if it were like, Frank, the limo driver, was like, you said you could get me an audition with Marty Wolf, but you're just lying. You've been lying since I met you. You don't know how to tell the truth. And then even Kaylee could have been like, you know, we are getting into more and more trouble because you can't seem to tell the truth. Are you sure you even wrote 
with that paper to begin with. Like people can really all doubt him. And that's when he's like, I gotta earn people's trust back one last time. But whatever, we got what we got. We got the movie we got and I loved it as a kid. And now, I mean, it's kind of not that great, but it's also over. Congratulations, it was incredible. Oh, and your mom also told me she loves you and is proud of you earlier, but she's already said her like three lines in this movie and the studio won't approve a final cut where more than a couple women seem like real people. Although they did say we could have an unlimited number of cartoon animals with boobs or talking cars with eyelashes. But for this story, that's all Jason Shepard wrote for Big Fat Liar. Once again, I love going back to these movies that I thought were cinematic masterpieces pieces as a child. Like I probably would have said this was one of my favorite movies. And now I get to watch it again and be like, oh yeah, like most things that I liked as a kid, it no longer tastes good. <laughs> but compared to other ones that we've seen, I think this is a more respectable kids movie in terms of like respecting a young person's intelligence and ability to comprehend a story. And there is even some rewatch value because, you know, I watch it now and I'm like, oh, Paul Giamatti was definitely playing that character to be racist, which as a more experienced and accomplished actor, actor in a movie like this, I would imagine he would have to give himself some sort of grounded motivation for being as rude as he is to people. So for all of those reasons, I definitely recommend checking out this one, whether you've seen it before or not. But I wanna hear what you think about Big Fat Liar. Do you remember this one, watching it as a kid? What do you think about my love Amanda Bynes' debut film performance? Let me know in the comments below. Also give this video a big thumbs up if you wanna see even more Frankie Muniz or Amanda Bynes fair. But most importantly, if you're new to my channel, I would love to have you click that subscribe button right over here. That way you never miss new videos from me. I upload two new ones every week. So turn on notifications and you'll always be the first to know when you're an early 2000s layered t-shirt son of a gun like me. Also, I've got merch available and a Patreon where you can access exclusive watch parties and bonus episodes. You guys are all the greatest. Thank you so much for flying across country to yell at some movie producers with me. I will see you next time.